Auditorium. My name is Sebastian Rubenstein. I'm the interim director of the Center for Judaic Studies and Contemporary Jewish Life. And um, I'd like to welcome you all here in stores and via video link uh, at the Stanford campus uh, to our annual academic convocation on the Holocaust. The term convocation means literally a calling together. The purpose of the convocation is to call together the university community at large and the community beyond the university um, to commemorate together the victims of the Holocaust, to remember the atrocities, the murder of millions committed by Nazi Germany and its allies, and to learn about how the genocide unfolded. And I think it is important in this context to emphasize not only the responsibility of the perpetrators, but also the responsibility of the bystanders who enabled the genocide simply by doing nothing. Yet forms of public commemoration are meaningless if we don't learn from it. And the first step in learning is to engage in the activity of thinking. As uh, political theorist Hannah Arendt points out, herself a refugee from Nazi Germany. I'm delighted that we have with Professor Timothy Snyder, a speaker here today who encourages us to think with him as he treats the Holocaust not only as history, but also as a warning. Before I invite President Herbst and Dean uh, Glassberg to offer a few words of welcome, I'd like to recognize two members of our community to whom the Holocaust is not merely something you learn about in a history class. First, Professor Emeritus Hans Laufer, a molecular and cell biologist here at UConn, who told us at the Kastana commemoration last November about his experience, how he, as a young boy, heard the shattering of the windows on November 9, 1938 in town in Silesia, and how his family store was destroyed. He was fortunate to leave Germany alive, Many of his family members did not. I also want to mention Joan Zalia Sidney, a second, genera second generation Holocaust survivor, who in her poetry bears witness to the atrocities that were committed under the German occupation in her family's hometown, Zorovno, in Poland. Joanne is also a writer in residence at our center, and she is here. I'd like to thank the president of the University of Connecticut, Susan Erbs, and the Dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, Davida Sofan Glasberg, for taking the time out of their busy schedules to join us here for the convocation and lecture and for offering a few opening remarks. Your presence is testimony to the importance the university places on remembering what in the world of so-called alternative facts has somewhat unexpectedly become controversial. Thank you to former Provost Jeremy Teitelbaum, who's also here, for his continued support for the Center as Dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences and later in his function as Interim Provost. Vice President for Global Affairs Dan Wiener is here, who is finalizing the work on a project on the European roots of Jewish Hartford, a project that will officially be launched later in May. Thanks to Jeffrey Scholzen, who uh, is uh, now Vice Provost for Interdisciplinary Affairs and uh, was uh, my predecessor at the Center. He led the Center uh, for five very successful years and provided invaluable advice during the time of transition. Thank you. I'd also like to thank Arnie Dushevsky personally, the founder, founding director of the Center for his insight and support ever since I've come to UConn. Ellen and Morris Morgenstein are here, uh, daughter and son-in-law of Marty and Jan Fierberg, after whom the lecture is named. You and your parents' generosity as well as the generosity of Fred and Eileen Stern, who are also here, is what sustains us. And finally, I would be remiss uh, in not mentioning our outstanding staff, Pamela Weathers, Matt Perrin, and Kizia Mann, without, who, who, without whom our events and everyday operations wouldn't be possible. And now, please join me in welcoming President Herbst. Thank you, Sebastian. Um, I didn't know there'd be so many introductions, so I'm going to pitch the one that I brought with me and just you know, speak a little bit from the heart. Um, this is a very important day for us. We're really glad to have such a distinguished speaker from, from down the road. It's somebody who's really gained international acclaim for his work um, on the Holocaust. Uh, so a few things. I don't know if you saw the article in the New York Times, I think it was last week, about remembrance of the Holocaust, um, especially among 
students today um, and even millennials and um, how worrisome that is. So maybe some of you go take a look at that, but it was chilling. Um, and it was just a reminder to all of us how important this work continues to be. Uh, not just this genocide, but all the genocides that we've witnessed um, in human history. Uh, what is UConn doing about it? Well, we have amazing people like Sebastian, like Jeff, uh, so many others who teach in this area, um, historians, people in literature departments. So I think you know we keep it alive in our curriculum for our students who come to UConn. And you know, granted, that's only a sliver of, of undergraduates out in the world, but but we do our part, and of course, our faculty publish on these subjects. Um, so we do those conventional things, but I think very importantly is that UConn has always had a, a kind of a history of social justice. You know, uh, Bruce Stave, one of our terrific faculty members, passed away recently, and his his memorial service is um, is on Friday, and he's the he's the historian of UConn. You know, he's he's written a, a beautiful book about this campus in particular, and um, students today are delighted to read that UConn decades and decades ago was a place interested in social justice. We were a place that welcomed Japanese students playing internment in California. Um, our students here fought against racism and fraternity life. Um, our students were very active during the Vietnam fighting the, the, um, the acts of illegal acts of their own government. So um, it's a place of social justice and that continues on into our Human Rights Institute, which is one of the great gems of the University of Connecticut. We're one of the few places in the country that has a human rights undergraduate major. Many of you are, are probably here today from that program, um, but it's something we build on that we have donors contributing to, and that's, that's extremely important for us and obviously very much um, foundational to work on the Holocaust. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention, and Sebastian knows knows about this very well, as does Dan Weiner, our vice um, vice president for global affairs, is that we do. Um, Connecticut does have a special sister brother relationship with a with a state in Germany, Baden Württemberg. So that's uh, you know very far to the to the west. And all the great universities there, Heidelberg, Tübingen, Freiburg, Stuttgart. Um, all the I'm Dad, I'm thinking about our trip, <laughs> our trip through here. Um, and uh, it's, it's really, it's one of the many ways I think that we keep a very close relationship with um, one of the sites at least, or many of the sites um, where the extermination of Jews and others occurred. So, you know, having that kind of official relationship of the university and this state of Connecticut with Baden-Württemberg, I think is one of the many concrete ways, along with the Human Rights Institute and so much of what is built into our curriculum and our center, um, that that makes us, you know, it, it guarantees that the Holocaust will not be forgotten, lessened, diminished um, here at the university. But up to all of you in the next generation to do even better than we did on all these fronts. So uh, thanks so much to our speaker who I know is going to be introduced um, in a moment. Um, thanks so much to the Beerbirds and to their children who are here today uh, for being so generous to the university and helping with this. Um, we couldn't be more grateful. So thanks everybody. Um, and now I'm uh, delighted to introduce um, or to welcome uh, Dean Glassberg. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Um, <coughs> thank you to Sebastian Lovenstein and the Center for Judaic Studies and Contemporary Jewish Life for organizing this wonderful event. Um, welcome to Timothy Snyder and um, to the Fearbergs. Um, they continually contribute to the overall mission of CLAS and its commitment to diversity and a strong liberal arts education of the future citizens of our state and of the nation. CLAS considers commemorating the victims of the Holocaust and learning about human rights violations in general to be an important component of a comprehensive college education. Clearly, as a horrific turning point in history, the Holocaust serves as a stark reminder of the depth of, of humanity and depravity to which we can sink as a society if we do not remain vigilant and aware of history. As the philosopher Santayana has pointed out, those who do not learn history are doomed to repeat it. 
Given what all too frequent attempts at genocide have repeatedly shown, we are obligated to consciously remind ourselves that de efforts to dehumanize people as the other is the first step towards identifying them as unworthy of survival and deserving of genocide. Commemorations of the Holocaust are therefore critical as we remind ourselves that it can happen again and it must never happen again. Thank you so much. Dean Vasper, and um, it is now my distinct pleasure to introduce Professor Timothy Snyder. He is the Richard Levine Professor of History at Yale University and a permanent fellow at the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna. He is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and the Committee on Conscience of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. He has published widely, not only in scholarly journals, but also in the New York Review of Books, the Times Literary Supplement, The Nation, The New York Times to mention just a few illustrious venues. It's hard to keep up with the books he has written. I think uh, nine single authored uh, monographs so far. Um, is that right? I'll, I'll just mention the title of the three most recent ones, uh, Black Earth, The Holocaust as History and Warning from 2015, On Tyranny, 20 Lessons for, from the 20th Century, 2017, and The Road to Unfreedom, Russia, Europe, America, brand new and um, it has been available only for just a few days. If there are any left, uh, you can purchase a copy outside of the table. So please join me now in welcoming Professor Timothy Snyder. Thank you for joining me and colleagues uh, on this afternoon where it would have been easier to stay at home. Although I take for granted that a certain number of you were just in this building already and decided to stay under a roof. Um, be, be that as it may, what I'd like to do this afternoon is to remind us that if you're going to remember something, you have to know what that thing is. It's very easy to ask us to remember the Holocaust, but for most of us in this room, I realize there are some exceptions, we can't remember the Holocaust in the normal sense of the word. We weren't there in that time and place. Very often, the very idea of remembering serves as a substitute for precisely thinking, for thinking about how something like this might have been possible. And the subjunctive in might have been possible is, of course, unnecessary. It was possible. And that brute, overwhelming fact that it was possible is the thing that has to be brought home. So my lecture this afternoon will be much less about remembering and much more about reconstructing. Reconstructing in the sense of explaining causes. The Holocaust, like all other events in history, has causes, and it's extremely important for historians to continue to debate and to discuss what those causes were. The moment we stop discussing and arguing and trying to figure out what the causes of the Holocaust were, at that moment the Holocaust leaves history and becomes something else, becomes something much more fragile. It's extremely important for me personally, this is also a lesson that I've drawn from speaking about the Holocaust in many places over the last decade or so, it's extremely important that we try to keep the Holocaust inside history, connected to other historical events in a way which is factual, in a way, in a way which is plausible. Why? Because history always leads back to us. There's only one history of the world after all. Okay, I realize that was a slightly like late Saturday night, you know, you've had a couple of drinks type statement. But there is only one human history, and we're all participating in it right now. Everything which has happened in human history is in some way connected. The Holocaust affected the world that we live in now. And we're not very far away from that world. 
So the reason why the title of this lecture is The Holocaust as History and Warning is that history is warning. History is warning. If something can happen, if something has happened, that means that it could happen, and that something not very different from it could happen in slightly altered circumstances. So my task, as I understand it this afternoon, and we can talk about this amongst ourselves in, in 45 minutes or so when I'm done, my task this afternoon is to make an argument to you, perhaps a new argument, about how the Holocaust happened, what the causes of the Holocaust were, and hopefully in that way, we'll bring ourselves closer to the events and closer, and closer to a discussion which allows us to remember in a way which has sense. By the way, if you are on, on, on the phone, please don't be on the phone. If you are on your computer, I'm gonna trust you to be taking notes and not to do anything else. Um, I think it's particularly egregious when one's talking about the Holocaust to be buying train tickets and like, you know, and the other things you do when you're online, which I know all about, because I have a camera, and the camera is pointing on your screens right now, and I can look at this display and see what you're doing. Gotcha, you looked. Um, so, okay. So what I'd like to do then is I'd like to begin an argument with a couple of quotations, which I think help us help bring us back to the event itself and, and to the causes themselves. The, the first is, is from a Hungarian poet whose name was um, Miklos Vadnuti. He wrote, he was, he was uh, a forced laborer, this is 1944. He was correctly anticipating his own death. He wrote, I, the root, was once the flower, under these dim tongues my bower, comes the shearing of the thread, death saw wailing overhead. The other quotation with which I'd like to begin is much briefer. It's from a man called Feldshu, who was one of the commanders of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising in the spring of 1943. And in trying to describe the situation of Jews of the ghetto um, in basements, often in barricaded basements, as they were facing Germans with guns and flamethrowers, he wrote, people lived inside the earth. What I'd like to suggest is that these images of ground, of earth, of territory, are not just symbolic poetic references to death and its inevitability or, or to its imminence. That these descriptions of what we call the Holocaust in a, in a setting of earth reveal something very profound about the, the, the history and the causes of the Holocaust, which we might otherwise overlook. We have a tendency to reduce the Holocaust to images which allow us to distance ourselves from them. So for example, the stereotypical image of Auschwitz as a machine of death is extremely limiting. It takes an event which happened on most of the territory of Europe and puts it in one place. It takes a complex of institutions and humans and turns it into a machine. Who's responsible for a machine? No one, or perhaps just one person who, who threw a switch. That image, like other images of the Holocaust, takes us away from what was actually present. What I'd like to do with these very simple sources is to try to bring us closer to something which was profoundly true, and that is the relationship between the Holocaust and what we think of as the environment, the relationship between the Holocaust and ecology. What I want to try to show is that these, re these references to Earth are not accidental, that they reveal a kind of profound insight as to what was actually going on. In particular, that these references from 1943, 1944, helpfully point us back to Hitler's own ecology, as he described it in Mein Kampf and in his second book in the 1920s. Now, by ecology, I should hasten to add, I don't mean ecology in the positive sense of the word, right? I just mean ecology in the sense that, say, Mike Pruitt has an ecology. I mean that everyone has some kind of relationship to the land, right? And that politics often begins from what your relationship to the land actually is. In Mein Kampf, all of these ideas of Hitler's, and I take it, we assume that the ideas of Hitler have some importance. I also take it that we haven't actually read Mein Kampf, which is okay. That's what falls into the category of I've done this, so you don't have to. Um, but if we read Mein Kampf from the beginning, it's clear that what Hitler is offering is, a, is not so much a worldview, but a, a description of ecology, which goes basically like this. What Hitler says is that planet Earth um, 
has a thin layer of fertile territory. These, these are pages one and two of Mein Kampf. Planet Earth has a thin, a thin layer of fertile territory. The nature of human life is that we are all divided up into races, and that these races, just like species, have to compete for limited soil. And that's it. That's all that's going on, which is a very elegant, very reductive view of human life. We belong to races. We need to survive. In order to survive, we have to have land, because with land, we can grow food. That's it. That's it. That's the whole story. Now, if it seems more complicated to you, says Hitler, if it seems more complicated to you than that, it's because Jews have introduced other ideas into your mind. And this is where the anti-Semitism enters, in a very profound and very early place. So profound and so early that I hesitate sometimes even to use the word anti-Semitism, because anti-Semitism can mean a lot of different things. The way that anti-Semitism functions in Hitler's view is the following. If you think there's some reason why you should not be killing your neighbor because your neighbor is a member of another race, that means that Jews have entered your mind and have transformed you in a way which is sick and depraved. So according to Hitler, any idea which prevents you from falling upon one another right now is Jewish. Whether that idea is Christian mercy, whether that idea is working class solidarity, whether that idea is the rule of law, any idea which allows you to see in another person a human, any idea which allows you to see a reciprocal relationship among equal humans, that idea is Jewish, right? That idea is alien. When you look out at other people, you should just see us and them. You should see members of your own race and members of other races. That's what you should see. If because of Christianity or socialism or law or anything, you're capable of seeing humans, that just shows how profound the influence of Jews in the world is. And that, according to Hitler, is why Jews have to be removed from the world. Jews are the source of all of these things which we think of as sources of humanity. That is one grand illusion. We are fundamentally like animals. That is the way that we should, this gives a bad name to animals, by the way, and there's a fundamental misunderstanding of what a species is involved as well. But, um, but it, what, what Hitler is saying is that the, the, what the Jews have done is trans, done, they've done nothing less than transform the ecology of the planet. They've ruined the planet. They've spoiled nature by taking us out of our proper bi biology and into this other realm, into this supernatural realm. And that is why, according to Hitler, Jews have to be removed from the face of the earth. The only way to be absolutely sure that there are no Jewish ideas in your minds is to make sure that there are no Jews on the planet. So this is a very radical idea. And you see why I hesitate to describe it as anti-Semitism. Right? Of course, it is anti-Semitism. But it's a, very, it's a very radical view. And you, you can see from, from the beginnings um, where, of course, this is going to lead. Now, Another important aspect of Mein Kampf, which is often overlooked, is Hitler's writings about science. So um, I take it that, you know, that, that even among those of you who might have read Mein Kampf, you might not remember the parts where Hitler writes about fertilizers and about pesticides um, and about soil erosion. Why does Hitler write about these things? Because he's a graphomaniac? No. By the standards of the early 20th century, he's not actually much of a graphomaniac. People wrote lots, lots more than Hitler. He writes about these things for a particular reason. Hitler is trying to say that science cannot save us. In the 20s and 30s, it was precisely German scientists who were making the advances in, in fertilizers and pesticides, which were going to lead to the thing which we call the Green Revolution, which has created the world in which all of you grew, all of you grew up, in which food is cheap. Right? That's our world. That's totally new in human history. That's never happened before. Food has always been expensive. It's only in the last three generations that it's been cheap. German scientists in the 20s and 30s were at work on the technologies that were going to make that possible. Hitler had to explain, in order to save his own idea of life as constant racial struggle, Hitler had to explain that science was not going to save us. And so one of the points of Mein Kampf is that science is, in Hitler's word, a swindle. If you believe that science is going to change the conditions of the world in some fundamental <laughs> way, that means that you have fallen prey to, to, a, Jewish, to a Jewish swindle. 
Um, the third thing which is worth noticing about Mein Kampf, which is maybe a bit surprising and, 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 slightly, and slightly unexpected, is Hitler's idea towards the state. So we think of Hitler, or many of us do, as, as a nationalist, right? And a nationalist, whatever a nationalist flaws might be, a nationalist is not someone who wants to get rid of his own state. A nationalist is usually somebody who takes his own state pretty seriously. Hitler was not a nationalist in this sense. He didn't have any particularly strong attachment to the German state. He, Im he imagined that life was precisely a contest or a conflict or a struggle among races, in which the state was just one more creation of races. The German state of today could fall, it could be destroyed, another German state would arise. He did not imagine that the map of Europe, including the, including the, including the German state in the middle of Europe, was something which was, was, something which was, was, um, was profoundly permanent. And this is extremely important, right? Because the history of the Holocaust that we understand, which is basically wrong, is that the Holocaust happened on the territory of an authoritarian German state, which it didn't. The Holocaust did not happen on the territory of a, German, a authoritarian German state. Hitler managed to build an authoritarian German state between 1933 and 1939, but the Holocaust didn't happen then and there. The Holocaust happened entirely beyond the borders of pre-war Germany, and very, 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 very few of the victims were actually German Jews. And most of the German citizens, most of the Jewish citizens of Germany actually survived. So Hitler built an authoritarian state in Germany, but in 1937 or 1938, you wouldn't have said this is a much worse place than Poland or Romania. You certainly wouldn't have said it was a worse place than the Soviet Union, which was killing far more people at the time. So what was special about Germany was not that it was an authoritarian state, right? That, in a way, that's, that's very conventional. It's also very misleading. For the Holocaust to happen, states are going to have to be destroyed in the name of ideology. Now, how could Hitler possibly take these kinds of ideas and turn them into politics? Let me try to do it in front of you, hopefully not to you, but in front of you in the next couple of minutes. The way that Hitler takes this idea of anarchistic, unending ecological struggle among races and turns it into politics is by way of the idea of Lebensraum. Okay, so unless you're Austrian and you're shopping for furniture, the idea of Lebensraum is probably Foreign to you. So, what Lebensraum means or meant at the time, it's more or less a taboo word in Germany now, except for biological context. Lebensraum just means habitat, right? A lot of things that are taboo in German German are not taboo in Austrian German, which is an interesting subject all to itself, right? Um, which the Germans can't point out to you, but I will. Um, because the Germans have to be, Germans being Germans have to be polite about the fact that they think the Austrian coming to terms with the war isn't as good as the German one. And so the way they make it clear that they think it's not as good is by never mentioning it. <laughs> right? Got it. That's the way it works. Um, so, so Lebensraum means living space. It literally means space of life. Living space. Lebensraum. And in, in, if you're talking about biology or zoology, Lebensraum means habitat or ecological niche. It's what a species needs in order to survive. In, in, in Hitler's writing, what Lebensraum means is the same thing. It means your race is like a species. That species has to compete endlessly for soil in order to survive. Now, that's a very compelling political idea. Let's admit it. If you were, if you were confronted with the idea that you only, there has to be land. If you don't have land, you and your children are not going to survive, you will probably react to that kind of impulse. Americans react to far less frightful impulses than that very drastically all the time. So if the case is made to you that you're, you're running short on food, there's not enough territory, we need, we need more, it's probably something that one would react to. And note, in Germany in the 20s and 30s, food was not plentiful the way that it is now. It's very hard to think food back into politics once it's gone, and God forbid that we will have to do it again, but most of the time, food is in politics. If you were German in the 20s and 30s, you probably remembered the Great War, as Hitler did, when the British precisely blockaded Germany and cut Germany off from food supplies, and people actually were, at the time, hungry. Even without war in the 1920s and 1930s, Germany was still technologically incapable of feeding itself. It was literally dependent upon other countries to supply it with food. So this idea of Lebensraum, although it's coming down from this very high abstract ideological level, also appeals to people's everyday life in a way which we have to work a little bit to understand. So on the one hand, Lebensraum is about survival. It speaks to fear. It speaks to anxiety, right? which is something that we all know something about. On the other hand, there's another logic to Lebensraum. Lebensraum means not only habitat in the sense of survival, Lebensraum also means something like 
lifestyle. It mean, at the same time that it means you have to struggle and kill others because your life depends on it, at the same time, Lebensraum also means we Germans, because we're the highest race, deserve the highest standard of living. And who represents the highest standard of living in the 1920s and 1930s? The United States of America. So Hitler spends a good deal of time, especially in his second book, explaining that what Germany needs to have is the same standard of living as the United States of America. And he makes a very sophisticated point about this. He says, how do we know how well people are living in the US? Well, we know because of the mass media. It's less important what's actually happening in Kansas. What's more important is that the German housewife, I'm paraphrasing Hitler, the German housewife can read the newspaper or listen to the radio and figure out how well the Americans are doing. In other words, we've moved very quickly from an idea of simply maintaining life and surviving, reasons of fear, into an idea of envy, jealousy, keeping up with the Joneses, right? What we would call the American dream. Hitler looks at the United States and says, it's, we don't need to just live. We have to live as well as they live. And this is a point to which I'll return, that the United States in the 1930s was a society that Hitler very much admired. It's worth remembering that when you hear people say America first, because America first was the way that Americans expressed their admiration in return for Hitler's Germany in the 1930s, which is why it's such a scandalous slogan. I assume you already know that. So, um, so Lebensbaum is the way that these ideas of struggle are brought back down into politics in terms of democratic politics. And in the context of the Great Depression, at a time when there are millions of, of Germans who are unemployed, Hitler was able to, to win elections and thanks to some circumstances beyond his control, form, form a government. Now, how do these ideas, um, how are these ideas enacted in institutional politics? How do you take Germany, which is a republic in 1932, and transform it into an authoritarian state? and then into an institution which is capable of killing millions of people? That's not an easy question. And again, it's very often a question that we dodge by imagining that somehow the German state was special and the German state could do all these things. No, the German state before the Second World War did not actually kill that many people. By the standards of the Europe at the time, it was not impressive at all. Um, the concentration camps entered where Germany killed a couple of thousand people. But by the standards of, say, the Gulag, this was, this was nothing. It's only when the war gets going, right? It's only when Germany begins to enact this kind of racial struggle that the killing really begins to, to take on serious proportions. So why is that, or rather, how could that have happened? In here, there's a story of the 1930s, which I think has to be told in a slightly different way. What we can't say is Hitler came to power, there was a German state, he made the German state carry out the Holocaust, because that didn't happen. Um, what happened instead was, over the course of the 1930s, Hitler managed to bring ideas of statelessness and ideas of race inside the German political system and create potentials and carry out certain tests which showed what was going to be possible later on. So one example, for one example, let's consider the SS. If you think of the SS, you might be thinking, well, they were policemen, they had uniforms. No. What's crucial about the, about the SS, also if you're thinking about the United States of America on Germany 2018, What's crucial about the SS is that they're not a police force. They're, they're a non-governmental organization. Um, they're a militia. They're, they don't come from the state. In the beginning, they're not, they're not paid salaries by the state. The SS were part of Hitler's private bodyguard. Right? They, come from, they come up from what we call civil society. They don't come down from the state. And the SS are precisely the people who believe in the ideology that I'm describing. That is, we belong to a master race. Life is really about unhindered competition. And as soon as possible, we, the SS, are going to make that competition, that conflict, actually happen. These are racial warriors. They're not policemen. And this is, this is incredibly important to keep in mind. Because what happens in the 1930s is that the SS penetrate the police forces. And the police forces are thereby changed. The SS penetrates the armed forces. And the armed forces are thereby changed. By the time we get to 1939, there is a united command. It's very confusing its details, but there's a united command in which the SS and the police are all under one vertical command structure. Another example we're thinking about is the concentration camp. You might think the Holocaust happened in concentration camps, which it didn't. 
um, the, the concentration camp is, is a much broader phenomenon than the Holocaust itself. <laughs> Many countries have concentration camps, right? The, the name itself comes from British rule in Africa. Concentration camps are very widespread. To have a concentration camp is not the same thing as to participate, as to participate in mass killing. What, what concentration camps are important for, though, is that they are zones of lawlessness. If you believe the world is fundamentally not about the state, but about competitions among races, if you believe that mass killing is going to be carried out when you unleash, when you unleash, right, when you reveal the natural human capacity to kill the racial enemy, then the, what the concentration camp is comes into view. The concentration camp is a zone of lawlessness where things are possible that are not possible elsewhere. In Germany in the 1930s, it was in the concentration camps that the SS was allowed to beat and allowed to kill. The, the concentration camps, if you were a socialist or a communist, later if you were a Jew, if you were unemployed, if you were a drug addict, if you were gay, the concentration camps were places where you were taken where the normal rules did not apply, right? That's the importance of the, con the concentration camp. That's the precedent that the concentration camp sets. Because the way that the Holocaust will be carried out later on is that in Eastern Europe, a zone will be created that's far, far, far larger, but which is also a zone of lawlessness. It's going to be in a zone where the Germans say, normal law does not apply. Normal rights do not obtain here. It's going to be there that the Holocaust is going to begin. But to see that, we have to understand um, the 1930s as a time of accumulating potential. Not as a time when an authoritarian state was created that could actually carry out the Holocaust, because again, that never happened. If, 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 if Hitler was assassinated in November of 1939, as he almost was, it was a matter of 45 minutes, there would have been no Holocaust. And the way we remember Nazi Germany would just be in the context of all those authoritarian states in interwar Europe, right? We have to see something beyond the authoritarian state to see the Holocaust. And what I've tried, the case I've tried to make is that the first part of this has to do with the way that Hitler sees Hitler sees ecology and race, this, this view of politics. Now, I could have just described this as ideology, but if I'd said it's just ideology, then like the, the, the obvious move back would be to say we all know ideology doesn't matter. Of course, that's wrong. Ideology matters hugely. Ideology determines our life all the time. But if I'd said it's ideology, admit it, there would be a natural reflex to say, well, these ideas, you know, who knows about these ideas? Everybody's just really pragmatic, aren't they? Which is, by the way, But when, so, the, so the reason why I'm starting with, with ecology and with the earth and with the notion of competition among races is so that we can recognize ideas where they come from, right? From their roots into our lives, the appeals that they make to our emotions before we just dismiss them as being irrational or, or somehow just ideas that, that don't matter. So if we, if we follow this, this ecological idea, we see the Holocaust in a certain way. We see the Holocaust beginning um, when, when Germany invades the Soviet Union in June of 1941. Why does that matter? Why the Soviet Union? Why the Soviet Union? Because the territory that Hitler sees as Germany's Lebensraum, as its living space, is precisely Ukraine. Right? For, from Hitler's point of view, everything else that matters in the war, including all the things that we think of being so important, like France, those are just prelude. Right? That's just accidental. Fighting a war against Britain was an unfortunate accident. He didn't particularly want to have to do that. In fact, he preferred not to do that. He didn't think he was going to have to do that. What really mattered was Ukraine. The idea was that we can break the Soviet Union, take the fertile territory of Ukraine, and thereby transform Germans, Germans who were going to win a racial war into this larger people that are going to be able to feed themselves. And why is this going to be easy? Why? Because, says Hitler, the Soviet Union is a, is a Jewish state. Because remember, capitalism, communism, everything, all these ideas for Hitler, all the ideas except his own, are Jewish ideas. If the Soviet Union is a Jewish state, as soon as you hit it once, it's going to collapse. That's Hitler's idea. We'll, we'll attack the Soviet Union, it'll fall apart in a few weeks, um, the inferior Slavs will welcome us with open arms because they'll prefer us to their Jewish oppressors, they'll take all their food and starve them to death. That's the idea, right? The idea is that in the first winter after the invasion of the Soviet Union, 30 to 50 million people will be starved to death. And that's how racial war is going to begin. That's how Germans are going to transform themselves. Thus, the Holocaust in this sense begins in July of 1941 with Operation Barbarossa. 
Um, in the more specific sense of the murder of Jewish women and children, it begins in July of 1941 in the swamps of Polesia, which is a region between um, southwestern Belarus and northwestern Ukraine. In September of 1941, again following this ecological logic, in September of 1941, the order goes out to German soldiers that they have to feed themselves from the land. In other words, this notion of a struggle for food is made literal day to day. The soldiers come first, then the horses, right? Um, remember, Germany invaded the Soviet Union with horses, not with the horses. This was still that period. Um, Germany invades the Soviet Union with horses, and keeping the horses fed is enormously difficult. Again, that's not our world anymore, so we don't think about it. Um, are any of you agriculture majors? All right. I mean, sort of. Okay, you're double majoring in something. All right. Um, it's, it's your life. I'm not here to press. Um, so, but so feeding yourself, feeding your horses, and then the locals come last, and the Jews come at the bottom of the list of locals, which of course then creates the argument, perhaps we should kill them in some other way, rather than letting them starve to death, which is an argument that is made beginning in the fall of 1941, all over the Eastern Occupation Zone. In December of 1941, when, as every American will know, um, the United States enters the war because Japan bombs a U.S. naval base in Hawaii. Um, in December of 1941, Hitler says something very interesting. He says, these events only confirm what I've been saying from the beginning. If the United States is in the war on the side of the Soviet Union and on the side of Great Britain, what this means is that capitalism and communism come to the same thing. The Jews are responsible for both. They were all always against us from the beginning of time. This has only revealed itself now in December of 1941, but it was always true. And therefore, it's confirmed that what we must do in order to win this war is kill all the Jews. Which he says in one way or another roughly a dozen times in December of 1941 and, and a number of other times in January of 1942. And again, it follows this ecological logic. We as Germans are the superior race. We have the right to Eastern Europe. We have the right to Ukraine. If we are not winning it, the reason is that Jews around the world are inserting these inappropriate ideas like capitalism and communism into people's minds. Therefore, as we prosecute this war and as we persecute the Jews, we are restoring the natural balance. Right? This is the argument that Hitler makes. In summer of 1942, again, just continuing looking at the Holocaust through his ecological logic, in the summer of 1942, um, in, in occupied Warsaw, um, the, the, the deportation of Jews from the ghetto to Treblinka, where some will be shot, most will be gassed, begins. How were Jews drawn to the Umschlagplatz? How were they drawn to the, 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 the point where they boarded the trains? They were promised bread marmalade. They were promised bread marmalade. Why did that work? Because they really were living in a world of scarcity. Of course, they must have thought that they were being lied to. But when you really are hungry, the very word marmalade will exercise a power on you that I think most of us would have a hard time imagining. Spring of 1943, again, moving through the history of the Holocaust, just following this ecological logic. Spring of 1943 is the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. It's put down by a man called Jürgen Stolp. Jürgen Stolp later was in prison with a member of the Polish resistance, and the two men talked. And um, the, uh, the, the, the Pole asked him, what were you thinking when you put down the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, when your men were going from those basement bunkers to basement bunkers and shooting and flaming people out. What were you thinking? And Stroop said, I was thinking of the milk and honey of Ukraine. And that's what the war was about. Even at this most literal and most possibly intense moment of the murder of Jews, it's, it's, it's an ecological vision. Okay, so the first cause which I've tried to bring to life bring to mind, bring to life, bring closer, is what I'm calling ecology. Um, the second that I'd like to bring to mind, I've already suggested it, is the destruction of the state. And I'm going to begin this, um, I'm going to begin this with, with a story. So the story, by the way, I mean, the reason why I'm citing this first person evidence, one of the reasons is that there's a lot of it. One of the things that people say when they talk about the Holocaust and the memory of the Holocaust is that it's, it's lost to us, there are so few survivors, there are so few sources. This is not true at all. There are still quite a few survivors, but there are tens of thousands of first-person sources. 
tens of thousands of first-person sources, some from people who survived the war, a few from people who did not survive the war but nevertheless wrote something down during the war. The limitation is not theirs. The limitation is ours, because those sources tend to be in Yiddish or Russian or Polish, which were the main languages of Jews at the time, as opposed to English and German and Hebrew, which are the main languages of Holocaust researchers at the time. That's not the fault of the Jews in question, however. Right? So one of the reasons why it's important to cite these people is just to remind us that if we want to understand or remember the Holocaust, there's a lot more guidance out there than we might otherwise think. So this story comes from someone called Elena Lipschitz, who left, um, who, who, who left her recollections in Polish. So Elena Lipschitz was, what I want to say about Elena Lipschitz is that she was completely typical. So the things that I'm going to tell you are going to sound extraordinary, but my point about her is, is, is that she was completely typical. She was a Warsaw Jew when, um, when Germany invaded Poland from the west on the 1st of September 1939. She fled to the east. This was very typical. About a quarter of a million Polish Jews, not only Jews, but about a quarter of a million Polish Jews fled to the east. On the 17th of September 1939, the Soviet Union invaded Poland from the east. Poland was doubly invaded. That's how the Second World War began. It began with Germany and the Soviet Union as allies. That combined invasion very effectively destroyed the Polish state. Both the Germans and the Soviets said the Polish state does not exist. So Irena found herself very quickly under Soviet occupation in a little tiny village called Bisotsk um, in this marshy region called Polizia, which is in, now in northwestern Ukraine. Um, so Irena, who is a Polish-speaking Jew from Warsaw, I don't think she knows any other languages, is now in a village where most of the Jews speak Yiddish, um, and where the surrounding population speaks something like Belarusian or Ukrainian, somewhere, somewhere in between. Um, so there she is in, in, in June and July of 1941, when the Germans betray their Soviet ally and invade the Soviet Union. And here's where geography comes in very handy. When the Germans invade the Soviet Union, what are they actually invading? In the first few days of the invasion, what they're invading is Eastern Poland. They're invading the Polish territories, which they themselves had granted to the Soviet Union. So Eastern Poland is first occupied by the Soviets, then occupied by the Germans. So Irena now finds herself under German rule. Roughly a year after that, in September of 1942, um, the Germans, with a number of local helpers, um, round up the Jews of Vysotsk and take them out to be shot. And at this point, she flees. She flees into the marshes and tries to survive in the marshes. This is difficult for her. She is, as I said, a city girl. Um, she's, she's not someone who's going to survive on berries and, and mushrooms for very long. So, in, so instead, she goes, out, she, find, she goes out to the nearest track and says, I'm just going to put out my hand. I'm going to ask for help for the first person who comes by. So she does this. Someone approaches her. Again, remember, she's in a place which is completely strange to her. Someone approaches her. He emerges over the horizon. She sees him, and he's carrying a shotgun over his shoulder. Okay. Now, this story is absolutely typical of the Holocaust. It's very far away from our dominant images of the Holocaust. There's no machining here. There are only people. There's no Auschwitz at this point. I'm talking about 1942. Auschwitz is not a mean, is not an important death facility for Jews. It will become so in 1943. It only becomes the most important in 1944. And the Soviet and the Polish Jews, who are the most important victim groups, are generally not killed at Auschwitz at all. He's carrying a gun. That is how the Holocaust began. The Holocaust began not with gas. That comes later. It began with shooting, very close, face-to-face, -face, intimate shooting. Um, that's how it begins. And it continues as a murder by bullets all the way through 1944. So roughly half the victims of the Holocaust are shot. Roughly half the victims of the Holocaust are gassed. Where are the nations in this story? So when we want to explain the Holocaust, we have a very strong, a very strong, very human, although I think actually um, rather, uh, rather distinctly malevolent, a very strong, very human tendency to say, OK, well, that can be explained by the other person's ethnicity. Right. So, and, 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 and it's forgivable. It's, we all forgive it. If we say, well, the Holocaust happened because the Germans are so orderly. 
right? That's an ethnic stereotype, which is precisely the kind of thing which the Holocaust should educate us against, and yet we permit ourselves to do it. Or we might say, the Holocaust happened because the Poles were this way, or the Lithuanians were this way, or the Ukrainians were this way. And Poles, the Lithuanians, the Ukrainians were, are imperfect, indeed, as are, as are we all. But I want you to note that in this story, there isn't really a nation. And then herself is a, is a Jew who speaks Polish. She's with Jews who speak Yiddish. She's in a place where people speak Polish, Belarusian, Ukrainian. She experiences occupation by people who speak Russian. Then she experiences occupation by people who speak German. Um, then she flees and she ends up speaking to, to people who speak this mixture of Belarusian and, and, and Ukrainian. And by the way, Polesia itself, where the story works itself out, is a tradition, is a place in Europe where notoriously people, when confronted with censuses and asked what their nationality was, said, we don't know, right? We don't know, or we're from here. Right? We're from here. So where is the nation? Right? Because that's our reflex. If we can't have the Holocaust take place by a machine, which, which distances it from all of us, we then will push it on to someone else's ethnic characteristics, which at least pushes it away from us personally. Right? Those are our reflexes, but those are distancing reflexes. They're not explanations. Explanations always serve to bring it closer. So what I want to say about Irena and this story is that although it's far away from the images that we might have about the Holocaust, it's actually very close to the way Hitler thought about the world, and it's also very close to the way that scholars of genocide think about the world. So in her actual struggle for life, right, where she was thrown upon the mercy of someone else, that's how Hitler thought that Jews were going to die. Jews are going to be put into a natural struggle. All of their amazing supernatural powers to put ideas in other people's heads would no longer matter, and they would die. That is pretty much what a situation looked like. But interestingly, what Eden experienced is also very close to the way that scholars of genocide look at the world. So here, here I take a step, a step away and talk about the scholarship for a minute. It's very interesting what the scholar, scholarship of genocide as such has to say. The social scientists who work on genocide generally argue that mass killing, political mass killing, is not carried out by stable authoritarian states. It's generally carried out during conditions of civil war, when borders are being breached, or when states are falling apart. And this is, these are quantitative results, right, being, being found by people studying masses and masses and masses of cases. This is extremely interesting, because what does it suggest about the Holocaust? it suggests that the Holocaust ought not to take place in a consolidated authoritarian state, which it doesn't. It doesn't happen in Germany in the 1930s. But it should take place where that state destroys other states. And here we lead to the second thing which the scholarship says, which is so interesting. So the social scientists say state, the collapse of states causes mass killing. And then the historians say, because this is our job and it's what we're paid for, the historians say, I know an exception. Right? Social scientists know many things, and historians know one thing. Right? That's the rule. But the thing we know, we really know. Right? Um, so what historians will say is, I know an exception. I know, historians will say, of cases where the state itself killed large numbers of people. Cambodia, People's Republic of China, Soviet Union. What's interesting about those cases is that they are all party states. They are all places where the most important connection of the individual was not through citizenship to a state, but through history or through something else by way of a party. Now, why is that so important? Because it tells us what's actually unique about Nazi Germany. Nazi Germany is unique not because it stands apart from all the things that scholars study and argue, but because Nazi Germany brings together the two major trends in the study of mass killing. The trend that says, Party states kill, Nazi Germany was a party state with an ideology. And the ideology was this ecological anarchy that I've been describing. Right? So it's a party state. The ideology is to destroy other states. Therefore, both of the logics of mass killing appear in this single example, which helps to explain why the Holocaust is the largest episode of mass killing that we know. It happens, it also, I think, helps to explain why Nazi Germany kills more people, at least, than any of the other European cases. So if we then follow, um, not just the scholarship, but if we briefly follow chronology, we can see something else very interesting, which is that um, the history of the Holocaust 
also follows the history of state destruction. Ger the Holocaust doesn't happen in Germany in the 1930s. Okay, I've said that enough times. Um, when do things start to move? When Austria is destroyed in 1938. Between 1933 and 1938, um, it was not, Austria was not at all an unsafe place to be as a Jew. As soon as the state is destroyed in March of 1938, then Jews are removed from citizenship and things can happen to them which couldn't have happened to them otherwise. And suddenly Austria in six weeks becomes a much worse place for Jews to be than Germany had become over six years. Czechoslovakia is destroyed in, 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 um, in September of 1938 and March of 1939. What happens to the Czechoslovak Jews? Well, that the Czech Jews become German Jews, and they'll follow the history of German Jews. The Slovak Jews become part of a new Slovak state. Why is that dangerous? Why is a new state dangerous? Because whenever you write a new constitution, there's a moment when people float free of citizenship. And during that moment, you can write them into the constitution as second-class citizens. For example, you can say, these people don't have the rights to property or the rights to practice a profession. And if these people don't have the rights to property or the rights to practice a profession, within a few months they will be immiserated. And then you will say, as Slovak authorities did, what are we supposed to do with all of these useless people who don't even know how to make a living? We'll send them to a camp where they'll, where they'll learn how to work. And that camp is called Auschwitz. And the Slovak Jews are the first sizable transport of European Jews to Auschwitz. What happens to the Jews in the extreme far east of Czechoslovakia, in a place called Subcarpathian Ruthenia? They go into the Hungarian state, that territory is granted by Germany to Hungary. Hungary doesn't grant them citizenship at all, not even second class citizenship, which means that they become the first victims of the Holocaust by bullets. So then Germany invades the Soviet Union. Hungary takes the opportunity and deports these people eastward into the path of the German army. The, the, German, the, German, the German SS takes these people, this is a Kamienz Wodilski, the first, the first mass killing of more than 10,000 people in the history of the world, not just the Holocaust, but the world, um, and, and shoots them. Now, and then the importance of all this is that every time a state is destroyed, possibilities emerge which weren't there before. In 1939, Germany invades Poland, but Germany doesn't just invade Poland, Germany doesn't occupy Poland, literally doesn't occupy Poland. Occupation admits that there's something called a state which you are temporarily occupying. The logic of the German war against Poland was a colonial logic. There is no Polish state. We are moving into territories which are inhabited by unknown peoples who do not know the law. <coughs> That's the kind of thing that Europeans said about Africans all the time, or Americans said about Indians for that matter. But it was, it was new in Europe. So the logic is there is no state. Therefore, the moment that Germany arrives, the Polish civil code ceases to exist. Well, you might think, well, why does it matter if the civil code exists? Because if the civil code doesn't exist, your life immediately becomes anarchy and people take your things and kill you, that's why. That's why the rule of law, by the way, is so important. That's why when people yammer on and on about Mueller and the rule of law, this is why we care about that. So when the Polish, when the Polish civil code ceases to, because I'm one of the people doing the yammering, so I can say that personally, <laughs> this is why I care about that. This is why I care about that. When the rule of law ceases to function, all kinds of things are possible that weren't possible before. What, after all, is a deportation to the ghetto? A deportation to the ghetto happens after Jews no longer have their normal rights, for example, the right to property. Why don't their Polish neighbors want them back? Is it because they hate Jews? Some of them did, some of them didn't. But when there are no property rights, people just take property. And then their attitude about the people who held the property before becomes suddenly very negative, which is a universally observable Phenomenon, right? So all of these things make, make the Holocaust more likely. And then it's in, it's, in, it's in 1941, as we talked about before, when Germany invades the Soviet Union, when the Holocaust finally becomes possible. Now, um, let's look at this from the other side. Who rescues during the Holocaust? Or how do Jews survive during the Holocaust? I'm just gonna, I'm gonna give this as the other side of the argument. Do Jews survive because they were good people? Very occasionally. I mean, at the end of Black Earth, I write about the cases where, um, where people rescue even though there's no reason to do so. And there are such cases, and they're beautiful, and they must be reported, and I spend a lot of effort trying to find them and report them, but they are, they are exceptional. Jews survived because states survived, even bad states. To start at one end of the argument, if you were an American Jew or a British Jew and you happened to be under in Germany in the 1940s, were you in any danger? No. You were in no danger because United States of America and Great Britain were states that Germany recognized. If you were a Romanian Jew in 1943, 
under German occupation in, say, France. Were you in danger? No. Because Romania at that time, not before, Germany before, Romania before that had killed about 300,000 Jews. But by 1943, Romania was recognizing these Jews as citizens, which meant that Germany had to recognize them as citizens, which means that they weren't killed anymore. If you were part of a state that Germany recognized, Germany did not kill you, right? The state had to be destroyed first, um, which means that it was much more dangerous to be in a place like the Soviet Union than in a place like Hungary. Is that because the Soviets were more anti-Semitic than the Hungarians? No. It's because the Germans set out to destroy the, the, the Soviet state, whereas the Hungarians were, were German allies. And here's, here's the seeming paradox. If you were a Jew and a German ally, your chances were much better of surviving than if you were a Jew in a country that Germany tried to destroy. Right? Much better. Um, so let's look at an extreme comparison. Estonia. Um, and uh, Estonia and, and Denmark. Now, in the Estonian case, 99% of the Jews are, who, are, who are there when the Germans arrive die. In the Danish case, 99% of the Jews who are Danish citizens survive. Is that because the Estonians are, ever, are so much worse and the Danes are so much better? No. It's because, in, I mean, and we can run the argument any way we want, but we're not going to find much more anti Semitism in Estonia than in Denmark. If anything, it's the other way around. Um, the difference is that in Denmark, you have the occupation which is closest to normality. Um, elections are held, governments are changed, the Jews remain citizens, and the Danish, the Danish government tries to protect its Jewish citizens. Even Danish citizens that are sent to German camps are protected because the Danish government intervenes on their behalf. That cannot happen in Estonia because the Estonian government is destroyed by the Soviet Union in 1940, and then the Germans drive out Soviet power in 1941 so that Estonian Jews have no state that could possibly protect them, right? They're completely cut off from political life. And there are other forms of politics that, of course, emerge when property is destroyed, when double occupation takes place, which makes collaboration and mass killing possible. But let me press the question one step further. Who, who actually survives? What about France? Who were the, the victims of the Holocaust in France? Polish Jews. Polish Jews. Not just proportionally, but in absolute numbers. More Polish Jews are killed in the French Holocaust than French Jews. Why is that? It's not Polish anti-Semitism, right? Which is a very bad and destructive thing, but which is not operative in Paris particularly. Why are more Polish Jews killed in the French Holocaust than French Jews? Because they had no state protection. In order for French Jews to be killed in the Holocaust, they had to first be acknowledged by the French state, which existed, as not being citizens. This happened to several thousand people, um, and those people were killed. But most French Jews are going to survive. Polish Jews in France, on the other hand, are refugees, right? And they're refugees who have no state that recognizes them. And by the way, they understood their peril, right? At the time, people said things like, the passport is what keeps body and soul together. That was a Polish saying. Jewish saying, Ukrainian saying also too. The passport is what keeps body and soul together. They, they knew this. Um, so, or to push the point one last level, who rescued Jews? I mean, in numbers. Who was capable of rescuing Jews wholesale? Not just one here or two there, but wholesale. Diplomats. Diplomats. Diplomats are very important people. Diplomats are very important people. They're often underestimated. In our current moment, they're certainly underestimated. Okay. Diplomats are very important people. The reason why diplomats were able to save Jews in the Holocaust is because diplomats could perform the magic of extending state recognition to people. So Raoul Wallenberg, who was an amateur, um, who was an amateur diplomat, entirely funded by the Americans, by the way. This was America's only meaningful intervention to try to slow the Holocaust. Um, Raoul Wallenberg could hand out thousands of pieces of paper to Hungarian Jews who were then recognized. Right. Or the Japanese consul in Lithuania, Sumihara, could hand out thousands of pieces of paper, um, thanks to which many of my friends and teachers are in North America today. Right. Some of my students are the grandchildren of those people. Um, over and over and over again, the Chinese consul in Vienna handed out pieces of paper, thanks to which people survived. Why? Because of the state. Right. Because of the state. Okay. In just a minute or two, what I'd like to do is, is ask, um, if you'll just ex accept with me for a second, that these causes that I've talked about, the ecology and the statelessness, if, that, they have, that they have something to do with the Holocaust. Let's ask ourselves if these are lessons that have been learned. And I would say, no, 
And it's not just that they haven't been learned, it's that the way we get the Holocaust wrong sometimes leads us to do things which, 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 are, which are regrettable. So if we think about the Holocaust in terms of state destruction and ecology, then subsequent events become less inexplicable. Right? Every time there's an episode of genocide or ethnic cleansing, the tendency is to say, we don't understand. How could this possibly have happened? There must be ancient hatreds among those like, you know, inscrutable people, wherever they are. So, um, but Yugoslavia, very much about state destruction. Sudan, Rwanda, and today Syria. In all those cases, we can talk about it more. You find the elements of both of both a threat to the state and ecological motivations. Right? Um, what's happening in Syria now with the Yazidi and others would not be possible without a drought, right? And that drought is a result of, you know what it's a result of? It's a result of, of climate change. Have we learned these lessons? No, I mean, if anything, the way we talk about the Holocaust politically pushes us, I think, in the opposite direction. So think of the American invasion of Iraq in 2003. The argument that was made there was that there's a bad authoritarian state, bad authoritarian states cause genocides, therefore we're going to destroy that bad authoritarian state. Let's think about that logic in light of what we just talked about. Is it worse to have an authoritarian state, or is it worse to have conditions of complete anarchy? Right? The US invasion of Iraq, I can't say reminded us because we never remembered it in the first place. Memory, very tricky. The history, the history of, of the invasion of Iraq is another example of this. The destruction of the Iraqi state brought about much more killing than the Iraqi state itself was capable of and has brought about chaos which is still, which is still going on. Or consider the way the United States talks about itself. Right? The lesson that the United States seems to have learned from the Second World War is that the state is a bad thing. When we argue about the Second World War, we say things like totally senseless things, which are historically completely wrong, <laughs> about how um, it was the, the growing German state or the welfare state or something which led to Nazi Germany and hence the Holocaust, which is completely bogus, right? If anything, the exact opposite is true. Um, but we identify, we identify freedom and we refer to the Holocaust as the absence of the state. And we seem to think we're performing virtuous acts when we weaken our own state. If anything, it's, it's really the contrary. Um, the, the, to spread the blame around a little bit, Russia does exactly the same thing with respect to Ukraine. Russia tries to destroy the Ukrainian state on the logic that we, Russia, are saving the world from fascism. So once again, the memory of the Holocaust is invoked in order to do precisely the kind of thing which the history of the Holocaust should suggest that you probably shouldn't do, right? And all of this, all of this, um, without even mentioning ecology and science. The United States is alone in the world in having a major constituency which denies the evident scientific findings of geoscientists, climate scientists, biologists, oceanographers, etc., about the changing patterns of climate. There's a very specific resemblance which goes totally unnoticed between us and certain Germans in the 1930s. We make the claim, some of us do, we make the claim that science is a swindle, that if you think that science is going to change the relationship between yourself and the world, you've fallen for a swindle. We're the only ones who do that, right? And so therefore, we're the only ones who, have, who haven't learned that, that very specific lesson. Climate in general, right? Climate in general um, summons the possibility, right? The fact that global warming most affects Muslims, right? Global warming most affects the crescent of the world where a million Muslims happen to live. The fact that global warming affects places in the south of us, Mexicans don't migrate to the US now, they leave the US now, but if we desertify Mexico through global warming, they will come. Um, the things that we worry about, right, the possibilities that threaten us, are things that are all worsened by our attitude about, let's call it, ecology. Um, so that was, that was very brief, we can talk more about the present now if you like, but what I'm trying to suggest is the thing that I said at the very beginning, that memory, is hard for those of us who weren't there. Memory opens up a huge realm of precisely forgetting or ignoring. It's very easy to remember in the way that suits you best. And a sad thing about the history of the memory of the Holocaust is that people generally remember the Holocaust in the way that suits them best. Think for a minute, try to find an example of a politician who says, 
I remember the Holocaust one way, and then I read a book, and then I remembered it a different way. That doesn't happen. People tend to remember the Holocaust in the way that suits them best in particular historical circumstances. So what I'm trying to argue is that the history, we have to have the factual and causal history of the Holocaust, for one thing, in order to remember it at all. At all. Because without the context that hooks it into other things, it has no place to rest. But that we also have, the fact, have to have the factual and the interpretive history because that's the only thing that links it to us. It's the only thing which helps us to see how those perpetrators, as Sebastian said, or how those bystanders could have the trick behave the way they did because they're people like us, that's how. And it's only when we see the circumstances in which they acted that we see to what we are vulnerable. And that's what I'm trying to say when I say that history is by itself. If we get it, history is by itself always warning. Thanks. You ask questions, and I respond. Um, if you wouldn't mind just introducing yourself and ask questions, because I don't know you, and you probably don't all know each other either. interpretation of the causes of the Holocaust by pointing out where we have misread signs about the influence of the state of authoritarianism and so forth. But how do you explain how we came to misunderstand in the first place? Okay. Okay, that's a really interesting question. I'm going to try to answer it. But before I answer it, I just want to signal that as a matter which is important to me. The history of our misunderstanding is one history. Yes. And the history of how it happened is a different history. Okay. Right? And when we go this way, there's a certain temptation to go down this rabbit hole of self-criticism um, and to find that more important than, than this, which I think opens up even more you know, fertile grounds to be reflective. So first of all, we overlook central elements of the Holocaust because we came to the history of the Second World War late and from the West. So this will be an American and a British we. Um, the, the Americans and the British, especially the Americans, don't have a lively sense of the Soviet role in the Second World War. And the Soviet role is very important for this argument from state destruction. Um, I, don't, I couldn't go into this in detail, but the mechanisms by which people were brought into participation in the Holocaust very often had to do with double state destruction, where the Soviets first take away citizenship, and then the Germans come and take away Soviet citizenship, and people who had collaborated with one regime ended up collaborating with, with another. That kind of micropolitics only makes sense if the Soviets are in the story. And interestingly, the Soviets are just not in the story. And this is an empirical observation which I'm very comfortable with. Despite the fact that Soviet Jews are the second largest victim group in the Holocaust, despite the fact that the Soviet Union begins the war as a German ally, which seems like it must somehow be relevant, if you look up Molotov Ribbentrop Pact in books about the Holocaust, if you look in the index, you won't find it, right? So something has gone seriously wrong. Now, there might be an ideological reason for that as well, like that people prefer to argue from the right or, or, or from the left. Um, I'm sure that matters. But for whatever reason, the Soviet Union is often kept out of the picture. And people are very keen to keep the Soviet Union out of the picture, right? And, and because they're so keen, they miss certain, I think, sociologically neutral things about what it means to lose a state. Uh, OK, that's one. And then the second, coming from the West. So, it, so the, Americans, um, the Americans didn't liberate Auschwitz, right? They didn't. This is like, like this is one of the big, yeah, right? We didn't liberate Auschwitz. How many of the major death facilities did we liberate? None. How many of the death pits did we see? None. Right? The Americans did not get to the zone where the Holocaust took place. Um, 
you know, there are partial exceptions like, like Mauthausen, but in general, the Americans and the British simply never saw the lands where the Holocaust took place. Never happened. The Red Army liberated all of them, which means that um, our version of what German atrocity is is a concentration camp, right? The, the British version is Belzen. Um, uh, but we, so we, we did liberate some camps, and the camps were horrible places, especially at the end when people were starving to death. So it's very easy to think, you know, this was the worst of it. These are these piles of the mass shooting bodies. That must be the worst of it. That must be the Holocaust. But that wasn't actually the Holocaust. The Holocaust was sadly something much bigger and something much, much more atrocious and widespread in territory than those few camps that the Americans and the British got to. And that thought is so hard, right? If you read the correspondence from, from the, the British or the American soldiers who saw these things back to their families, it's very hard to then say, Yes, but that was only the edge of it. <laughs> that was, but it was. And so we have then been tempted to think that the Holocaust was something that happened in camps. And we vastly overestimated the experience, and this is the third thing, of people from the West whose experiences were accessible to us during the Cold War. So the, the, the entire territory where the Holocaust happened was on the wrong side of the Cold War from a Western point of view. The entire territory where the Holocaust happened was on the eastern side of, of the Iron Curtain. And so the experiences that come back to us of Italian Jews um, uh, or of, uh, like Primo Levi or of, of French Jews, even German Jews, are entirely exceptional. Um, these, these are people who come from places where the state existed, where there was a chance to survive, right? And that, those experiences, terrible though they are, and again, it's hard to say this, but terrible though they are, the, the, the paradigmatic images of the Holocaust, of like the train you know, taking you somewhere east, that's actually not paradigmatic, that's exceptional. The normal thing that happened in the Holocaust was that you were killed someplace very close to where you lived, very often by people who knew you. That's the paradigmatic. So, so the, the Cold War, right, and, so, and, and then, the, then there's the time of the Cold War. Like, this history is just like this, you know, the history of knowledge. The, history, the, the Cold War lasted long enough for the German historians to think that they had achieved a, or they had achieved a consensus about the Holocaust. So the historical slide of the late 80s is based on the assumption that we West German historians actually have something to say about the Holocaust, um, which is just not true, right? They don't have anything to say about the Holocaust. But enough time had passed for arguments to already have formed themselves. Then when the archives open and all these Polish and Yiddish and Russian sources are suddenly available, nobody's interested, okay? And this is, and this is the final thing. No German historian of the Holocaust learns an East European language in order to study the Holocaust. Not a single one. Even though if you're German, you could learn Yiddish during a, you know, you could learn it during a bad dream if you weren't careful. You just have to learn Hebrew alphabet in about 2,000 words, right? I mean, it, no, seriously. I mean, it's not, if you're German, it's almost a, an abuse of your position as a German historian not to know Yiddish, in my humble opinion. But they didn't learn it, right? Not to mention Polish. I mean, there were younger historians who did learn all these things. But my point is that no existing German historian of the Holocaust learned an East European language despite the fact that Eastern Europe was where the Holocaust happened. Right? That's the final answer to your question. That the Holocaust had already been channeled into national histories um, by the time we got to the sources that we needed to make these kinds of arguments. Thank you. I'm letting you decide to get the microphone. Okay. <laughs> this one. Shake. Shake. Uh, Joy Land, University of Connecticut. My question concerns one of your questions. You said, how did Jews survive? And um, my family survived. They were, lifted, they were Norwegian Jews, and many of them managed to get to Sweden. So there was a state. Many of them uh, had other me. And they all have survival stories. So those were individuals. But I wonder, how do you react to the resistance and refuge that Jews sought um, in the creation of the State of Israel, because that was not a state at the time, and yet it exerted a fairly large influence on the Jews of Europe. And I wonder if you could address that now. Yeah, Thank um, you. No, that's a great question. So um, the, the first thing is I want to comment on Sweden, because it, it, it brings out one of these basic factors of history, which gets overlooked in the kind of, in, 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 a, in a sort of moralistic and often nationalist way we talk about the Holocaust. There are generic factors, and one of them is foreign policy. So countries don't have to have a good foreign policy. But if they have a foreign policy, more Jews are going to survive. So in the case of Sweden, when the Swedes think that the Germans are winning, 
they behave one way. When they think the Germans are going to lose, they behave in a different way. Hence, Raoul Wallenberg, right? So when when Roosevelt starts the um, the War Refugees Board, that's an American program to pay neutral nations to use their diplomats to try to save Jews. Um, the Swedes send along Raoul Wallenberg. Why? Because they think the war is turned, and when things change, you change your foreign policy, right? Um, Romania. <coughs> Romanian foreign policy was to ally with Nazi Germany and invade the Soviet Union. That's a pretty bad foreign policy. Their foreign policy was to murder Jews that they found beyond their boundaries. That's a pretty awful foreign policy. And yet, because they were a sovereign state, they had a foreign policy. When they decided that Germany was losing, they could switch their foreign policy and announce in fall of 1942 that they were no longer going to murder their Jews. And then they could switch sides at the end of the war and join the Allied side. I mean, this, this may sound very cynical, but having a state means you have foreign policy. It's similar with the French. One of the reasons why, the, why, why, more, why French Jews survived in the war is that the French government, Vichy, which is the French state, starts to think that the war is going to go a different way. And so one of the, thing, one of the, one of the, um, one of the basic elements of statehood is that you have foreign policy. Whereas things, places like Croatia and Slovakia were not real states because they didn't really have foreign policy because as soon as Germany lost, they would cease to exist. That's very important because it meant that they could continue killing Jews right down to the last minute because they couldn't imagine a world where they were going to exist without Germany. So these basic things about sovereignty turned out to be really predictive. But Israel, I mean, you basically captured my slightly unorthodox approach to Israel in your, in your question. And I think histor historically, you catch something very important about what happened. Um, in, and it's, 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 of course, it can't really be told through the Zionist story, because the Zionist story has to be about how the Jews, all the Jews always wanted the state and so on. Um, like, all, you know, like all nations everywhere, Zion, Jews go through the same pattern, you have a glorious past, then you lose your state because of other people and it's their fault, and then you, then, then you get a state in the 20th century. The, the, the Jews have the same story that the Lithuanians have and the Poles have, and there's a reason for that, which is that everybody copied from one another. Um, you know, the whole thing is romanticism, right? It's just the three-stage romantic series of history, all nationalisms take it, the Jews are just like everybody else in this respect. Um, but, and so in Zionism, we can't really capture what happens because Zionism has a sort of pattern of things, how things should have worked, which is that Jews in the 1930s should have already won the Jewish state, but most didn't, right? In the 1930s, most Jews did not. In the 1930s, there were more Jews in Wuj, you know, which you may not even have heard, than there are in Palestine. What happens is just what we were talking about, I think, it, it, it's that many Jews become pragmatic Zionists because of the Holocaust. Right? Because of the Holocaust, Jews recognize that you can be separated from a state. And, 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 and one of the untold you know, chapters of the Holocaust, which, which comes into Black Earth a little bit here and there, is how Jews in various desperate situations try to get state recognition. Right? Like those Polish Jews in Paris that I mentioned, when the Polish state is destroyed in 1939, what do they do? They go to the Soviet consulate and ask for Soviet papers. That's not because they like the Soviet Union. It's because they know they have to have papers. They know they have to be connected to a state. And so the, 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 the extreme of this pragmatic reasoning is the only way to make sure you have states is to make sure it's your state. Is to make sure it's your state. And so by the end of the Second World War, there are, there are millions of people who have reached Zionism by that very pragmatic, realistic realm. Well, how does that help them? You didn't mention how that saved them or how that might have influenced their decision. Um, their decision to what? Yeah, but the thing is, the, the problem is you could, that it didn't much because during the war it was extremely difficult for Jews to get to Palestine because Palestine was controlled by the British Empire, right? I mean, there, there's a very interesting exception which has to do with you know with Swiss diplomats. There was a very interesting Swiss diplomat who had served um, in British Palestine and then ended up in Hungary representing British interests, because Britain had no embassy. And as the representative of British interests in Hungary, he gave out papers which allowed Hungarian Jews to go to Palestine, and thereby save several thousand Jews. But that's exceptional, right? That you couldn't, if you, as, a, as a brute fact, you basically couldn't immigrate to Palestine. Many people would have wanted to immigrate to Palestine. Many Jews would have wanted to immigrate pretty much anywhere, right? The Sugihara visa said you're going to the Caribbean, right? But the important thing was to get a piece of paper which allowed you to go out. I think uh, maybe one more question and then we have to uh, move out. Hi, my name is uh, Greg Bliss. I'm a political science and economics student here. Um, 
part of my family is Jewish, my mom's side, um, and then my dad's side Christian. Um, so my question to you is not so much addressing this, but you made a parallel to the Syria question now. Um, you've got this massive swath of land between like, you've got the Ukraine, you've got Turkish Kurdistan, all the way through, um, you know, Kurdish Afghanistan, that's essentially stateless and chaotic. Um, that, you know, is a breeding ground for genocide. What's really the answer to that situation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, so I like the way you posed the question because it seems to me that, it, that you've got your finger on what the answer has to be. We, we, and, and the answer is, has two stages. Those, there, there have to be states. There just have to be states. Non-governmental organizations and civil society and, um, and the United Nations and foreign countries are all very important. You know, it, it's very important to have various ways to react to humanitarian disaster and to genocide. But in order for in order for there to be normal life, there has to be the rule of law, and you can't get the rule of law without a state. The reason why that's hard is that nobody's ever formed a state on its own. You can't form states without other states around them. That's the paradox. And um, you know, the, the Europeans cheated. Here's how the Europeans cheated. The Europeans first conquered the world, and then when the world, then when their maritime empires fell apart, they joined one another in this process of European integration, and that's why they also have states, uh, because they did, they pulled this sleight of hand where first they exploited the world, and then they formed this huge trade zone, and then they tell a story about yes, there was British history and French history and Dutch history, which is all basically wrong. Um, there was imperial history, then there was integration history, and so. And the, the European Union, you know, shows you the, like, those are the most functional states in the world right there. Those are the states where people, where people have lived the longest, have the highest important levels of happiness, lowest levels of corruption, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and those are states which only exist, in my good way, because of other states around them. And so the trick that has to somehow be pulled is you form states by getting those states into good relationships with other states, which is why, in my good way, diplomacy has to be about some form of integration. The whole idea that any country can like do good for itself or others by saying, hurrah, we're one country, right? That's immediately going to be destructive um, for others and also for self. Because no matter how big you are, even if you're America or China or Russia, no matter how big you are, the moment you say, it's just me, is the moment when things are gonna to start to break up around you. So I, I can't get into like what I would do exactly about like Tajikistan or what I would do exactly about Afghanistan. But that's my general view. I have this very conservative idea about sovereignty, that there has to be sovereignty. And then I have this very cosmopolitan idea that the only way to have sovereignty is to have more, more sovereignty around it. And the only way to get to that is to have clever diplomats who find positive sum game um, ways to interact among neighbors. So for example, then, like with Syria, you, if you were the president, you wouldn't offer drone strikes into Syria because you would be like, that can create a stateless situation in which then you can have Assad or ISIS or some other guy just come in and be like, all right, genocide time? Well, so it, that's already happened in Syria, right? I mean, the, the, the Yazidi have already, I mean, even the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, which is quite conservative about this stuff, has already said that what, the way the Yazidi were treated were, was, was genocide. And, but even regardless of whether it's genocide, at least half a million civilians have died in Syria. It's, it's a terrifying situation. But I would begin somewhere more fundamental with Syria. And this is something that's totally, this is completely easy to forget. We, we, there, there used to be something called the Fertile Crescent. The Syrian economy existed because of the Fertile Crescent. The Fertile Crescent doesn't exist anymore because of climate change. Two million, so the story of Syria is this. Two million Syrian farmers immigrate to already overcrowded Syrian cities in 2011, 2012. Why are the Syrian cities already overcrowded? Because one to two million Iraqi citizens had fled the American state destructive war against Iraq into Syrian cities. So you have a textbook combination of what happens when you, when you intentionally destroy regimes combined with what happens when you have ecological scarcity. So then, there, of course, there's a, there's a narrative about what happens, which is there, there, there's resistance, there's Assad, and so on. But the basic causes are the things that one has to address. So like my opinion about whether I would, would or would not use drones or missiles um, is, is secondary. Like at this point, it doesn't, I mean, honestly, it doesn't make any difference what we blow up in Syria at this point. But if we want to have, if we want to have, if we want to minimize the risks of things like that going forward, we would have to have a foreign policy which actually recognizes causality. 
Right now, our foreign policy just recognizes TV reality, which is not the same thing. You know, we make orange streaks go across the sky, right? You know, we improvise, we react. If you actually want to make the world a safer place, you have to have some account. It doesn't have to be mine. Maybe mine is wrong. But you have to have some account about how causality actually works. Thank you. All right. Uh,